Hey, I'm Ari Zitten. I'm an instructor here at SAS in the Statistical and Analytical Education Department, and I have a background in physics and math, and today we'll be talking about some Python integration with SAS VIA. So the important part to remember to start off, basically that the way we do the Python integration is that we will use Python to send commands and controls to the SAS VIA server. So we'll be on a local Python install on a local machine. You could imagine it as being your laptop or your workstation at work. And then we're gonna connect up to the SAS VIA server, which you think of as sort of a server in some server room at your work. For us, it's an Amazon Web Services image. In general, what we'll be doing is submitting commands from Python to the SAS VIA server so that all the processing happens on the server. When we get into the software, I'll try and emphasize where the processing is occurring, whether it's occurring locally on your computer in Python or whether it's occurring remotely on the SAS VIA server. So we'll start by opening up Jupyter Notebook. We install Jupyter Notebook using the Anaconda distribution. You can sort of use any Python install you want. We're using Jupyter Notebook so that we can organize our work in these notebooks a little more easily. So I'll go to Documents here and open up the notebook that I've prepared. I have some pre-prepared code. I'll go through and explain sort of what's happening and what it's doing. And then at the end, I'll show you a little bit of how I would develop my own code afterwards above and beyond this. So just in the very beginning, I like to highlight there is a documentation page here and just a link and the link will be below. And this will give you access to the data that we're using as well as some other examples of programming in Python with SAS VIA. So when we start out, we import some useful packages. The important one that I wanted to highlight is the SWAT package, which stands for SAS wrapper for analytics transfer. This is the package that will allow us to submit from Python code to SAS VIA. Ultimately, what the SWAT package is doing is translating everything we submit into a form that the SAS VIA server can understand. The rest of these options are just Python packages. Pandas is a Python package we'll use for data analysis. Matplotlib is a Python package we'll use for plotting. And these last two statements are just options that we set so we get a little more information from our results. I'll click Shift Enter, that's just a Jupyter command, in order to run the cell. So we run the first cell, it has a little star while it's running. When it's finished, it has the letter one next to it. It's the first one we've run. This is one of the really important steps connecting to the SAS VIA server. We are making a connection from our local Python environment to the SAS VIA server, which is that remote server I mentioned earlier. This is the name of the server, the URL, where we connect through. We're connecting on port 8777, and we give our username and password in a real environment, you'd give your username and password in a token or in a hashed version. We just pass it through plain text HTTP because we're using a demo image. So in real life, you'd always wanna use more security settings than we're using here. I'll hit Shift Enter to run it, and this gives me a connection, and you see the connection is named con, and in the future, everything that I do on the SAS VIA server will be managed through that connection. So we'll get to it right away. I'm gonna load up some data, my data table, I'm going to call the local reference, Titanic TBL for Titanic table. The data set comes from survival on the Titanic, and we'll talk a little bit more about it as we explore some of our data. I use the read CSV to read a CSV file, and I'm reading it from my local machine. So I'm actually reading it from basically my laptop or workstation, wherever I'm working, and I'm loading it up into the CAS server with the name Titanic. And the CAS server is just the SAS VIA server. CAS stands for Cloud Analytics Services. It's just the workhorse, the processing power behind all of the actions that we're doing. I'll hit Shift Enter to run this statement. What we've just done is loaded data into memory on the SAS VIA server. So we now have a table Titanic, which is in memory on the server. Let's explore what this table is about. So we'll first look at some of the columns. What this data table came from was we looked at passengers on the Titanic and we looked at who survived and who died and we looked at various information about the passengers that will help us predict whether they died or survived. Things to highlight, survived is a binary flag that tells us whether or not the passenger survived. That's what we're gonna try and predict in our predictive modeling, which we'll be doing a little bit later. Some information like the name of the passengers, the sex of the passengers, the age of the passengers, the ticket that they purchased or how much they paid for the ticket. Some of these variables are gonna be useful in predicting the target of survived and some of them aren't. So we'll choose our variables a little bit later. One thing I like to highlight is I use this column info action. And so what I'm doing, the table lives in memory on the server, and I am sending a command out to the server to say, give me some information about the columns, and it sends that information locally. So, so far the processing has happened on the remote server. I'll now run the head function to show me the first five rows of the table. This is what our data table actually looks like. What I like to highlight here, and I'll point this out again as we move forward through this demonstration, 
we'll see that this head function actually brings data locally. So the whole table is in memory, and now we have these five rows that are brought locally to Python. So we can analyze these using Python functions or do various things in Python to them. But we want to often be careful because there might not be as much room locally on your workstation as there is in the in-memory server. So if you have a huge data set with millions and millions of records, and you ask for it all to be brought over locally, you might run into some problems. I'll come back to that a little bit later when we actually do that. I'll run the shape function to essentially tell me how big the table is. This is where we find out it's only about 1,300 rows. There were not millions of people on the Titanic, so we only had data on some of them. This excludes the crew, so it's all the passengers on the Titanic. 15 columns and 1,300, 1,309 rows. We'll get some summary statistics about the numeric and character variables. We'll use this describe action. All of what I'm doing so far are sending commands to the SASVIA server to ask for some results back. So in this case, we have things like the count of the different variables, the number of unique values. So you see key ID has unique value for every row because it's the unique ID that we'll be using to reference you know, which row is which. The mean, I like to highlight this, the mean is computed on the entire data set, but it's computed on the SASVIA server and the results are brought locally. So the mean is not computed locally, so all of the work is still being done by SASVIA rather than by Python. This is where we actually see where the data is located. I use the type function in Python and ask for the type of Titanic table, which is my reference to the in-memory data. And it tells me that it's a CAS table, swat.cas.table.cas table. That's what this object is because it lives remotely on the SASVIA server. If I ask for Titanic table.head, that brings a local copy to Python. And we see that it is, if I call the type function on it, it is a SAS data frame which means that the data is living locally on your Python environment. Oftentimes there might be so much memory that, I mean, excuse me, so much data that the in-memory space on SAS via server can hold it, but the in-memory space on Python can't. So if you ask for too much data, you'll end up crashing your local machine. So I often use these type functions to make sure I know where I'm putting my data and I leave it on the right environment basically. So I talked about how you can hurt yourself by bringing too much data locally. I'm going to give you a demonstration of bringing all the data locally. So here I call Titanic table dot to frame, and this creates a local data frame from the Titanic table. So this command right here, and I like to highlight this because it's very important, I brought all the data locally. If I had, let's say, 16 gigabytes of RAM on my laptop, but I had a table in the SASVIA server that was 64 gigabytes, and let's say my SASVIA server had, you know, 240 gigabytes of RAM because it's a big shared environment for everyone to share their data, if I asked for that 64 gigabyte table to be brought locally to frame, if I called this command, I would end up crashing my local computer because it would fill all 16 gigabytes of, of memory with the data. And there'd still be another 48 gigabytes left that it just would try and dump on my computer. Without any RAM, my computer would just stop working. So I always mention, be careful when you bring data locally and make sure that you're actually bringing a sample of the data that fits on your local machine. We just checked above our data, we only have 1,300 rows, so that'll fit locally in memory. We're going to now use Python. This is not using SASVIA at all. This is Python to plot a histogram of some of the inputs that we're going to be using. The histogram only works for the numeric inputs. So we see we look at a distribution of ages. We see most people were around 29 to 30 on the Titanic. A distribution of body. It turns out that the input body is actually the body identification number when they pulled the bodies out of the North Atlantic. So that probably won't be useful for predicting the target. Fair is how much they spent. We see most people spent the same amount on their tickets. A couple of people bought the executive suites on the top of the ship, so they paid quite a bit more. Of course, remember this is early 1900, so inflation plays a role. The key ID, we have unique values for all of them. The target survived. It looks like we have similar proportions of people who survived and died. One means they survived, zero means they died. It looks like more people died than survived on the Titanic. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the inputs when we build our predictive models. Now we're going to choose some of our inputs that we're actually going to use. And so we're going to keep the key ID as a unique ID. We'll be using sex, so whether they're male or female. We'll be using age, how old the passengers were. We'll be using fare, how much they paid for their tickets. We'll be using P class, which is the class that they were in. So that's first class for the nice cabins, second class for the medium cabins, and third class for the cabins near the bottom of the boat. That's P class, so it's a categorical variable with three levels. 
siblings and spouses. This one has a little bit less information because it's a mix of the number of siblings and or spouses that they have. So if you see one, it could be a spouse. If you see two or three, probably siblings. Not very many people on the Titanic who brought more than one spouse with them. And the target is survived. So we want to predict whether people are surviving essentially the crash of the Titanic. So I'm using pandas, and I like to highlight this. I brought all the data locally, and now I'm using pandas, which is just a Python package, to subset the data and create a smaller data frame. Data frame is the storage that the data, the way that the data is stored in pandas. Make a slightly smaller data frame, just to show you, and then I'll upload that data frame back up to the server. This is probably not a best practice. In general, you want to try and keep the data on the server rather than bringing it locally, doing some analysis locally, and pushing it back up to the server. But I wanted to demonstrate how to bring the data locally, what that means, and how you can do your manipulations locally if you want, and then upload the result back up to the server. So I'll make a, a, essentially a new table. I'll overwrite what I had, because I had a Titanic table on the server. So now I'll overwrite it with this data frame that I created, and then make a new reference to it. So I'll run this cell. And I always like to highlight what we've done. If I ask for the type of Titanic DF, which is the data frame that I was manipulating locally, it tells me it's swat.dataframe.sasdataframe. So it lives locally on the client. So that's in my Python install or my Python environment on my laptop. Whereas if I ask for type of Titanic table, that's a CAS table. So that lives remotely on the server. Now we have the data uploaded back onto the server and we'll be doing the rest of the analysis on the server and pulling our results back locally. This matches our best practices. I always like to mention I did this brief digression where I loaded the data locally and then pushed it back up just to show you how to do it, not because I think you should always do that. So we want to handle missing values. First, let's see, do we have any missing values in our data? I call the distinct action. So this is again on the server. It tells us we have some missing values for age and a single missing value for fair. Regardless, our predictive models, they really don't like missing values. So we'll do imputation. This is our first, what I think of as CAS action syntax. CAS actions are cloud analytic services actions. Basically, everything we're asking SAS via to do gets translated into these discrete actions that the computer knows how to process. So in this case, the action is imputing missing values. So we're asking SAS via, and it comes from the data preprocessing action set. So it's a collection of different actions related to preprocessing. This action is impute, and we're going to impute missing values on the Titanic table for the inputs age and fair. We want to copy all of our inputs over because we want to use the other inputs that we're not imputing. And then we want to save the table, overwrite essentially, save the table as the same thing. So we're going to impute all the missing values in place. I'll run this action. We see it outputs, it imputed these with the mean. I didn't specify that, I just accepted the default behavior. So by default, we impute missing values with the mean. And then if I ask for column info on this table, so this is asking me basically what, what variables are there in this table, we see that we have added imputed age and imputed fair. And those are the, those are the variables we want to use instead of age and fair. We're going to be doing some predictive modeling, and all of the predictive models expect a target, a collection of inputs, and it wants to know which of the variables are nominal and which are interval. So essentially whether they're numeric or categorical. The computer doesn't always know because survived, for example, is numbers. It's zeros and ones. So the computer, by default, might think it's an interval variable. But it's really a nominal variable because it's a binary flag. So the target we call survived because we know that's the target. I selected these five inputs, sex, class, siblings and spouses, imputed age, and the imputed pair. We didn't have to impute the other variables because there weren't missing values. And then sex, class, and survived are nominals. Sex is male or female, P class is one, two, or three. And so even though they're numbers, they're really categories. They're categorical levels, first class, second class, third class. I've just saved these. This is all Python. These are just Python lists, or in the case of the target, just a single string. And then we're going to feed these Python results into our predictive modeling tools in SAS via. So we're going to use this to fill in the CAS actions that we'll be submitting. Whenever we do predictive modeling, we want to partition our data. We build a model on the training data to try and learn the function, to try and predict the target. And then we check on the validation data to make sure that when we built a model, we built a model that actually generalizes, that works well on data it hasn't seen before. So I'll call the sampling action set with the SRS stratified random sample action to sample 70% of the data for training and leave the other 30% for validation. 
I run this partition, and I essentially all I'm doing is appending a column to my data table called partition indicator, or underscore part in underscore. And that'll be one for training data and zero for validation data. I'll just look at the data table. So head is just giving me the first five rows of the data table so I can look at it. And I can see here's my partition indicator that got appended. Some of them show up in the training partition. Some of the rows are in the validation partition. We're now going to train our decision tree model on the training data. So we'll just start with the decision tree model. I talked about decision trees in a previous video. I'll have some more advanced models at the end when I've decided once we look at the results of the decision tree model. So I'll start by running this action. I have the action set decision tree. I have dtree train, which is the action to train a decision tree, train the, the decision tree. I'll specify the table is Titanic. That's the data set we'll be using. And we'll use partition indicator equals one because we want to train it on the training data. You can see I specified target inputs and nominals. I always see this when people use Python code. Since we're specifying the target, we've named the variable target. When we say target equals target here, that's not actually a tautology because we specified what the target is up here. So we're just plugging in these values. I saved them here because it's going to be easier later on when I build some other models to just use these names. The CAS out, this is important to note, is the name of the model table that I'll create. So I'll be using that model table to score the model later on. So I'll run the decision tree model. It'll take a second to train. Of course, it'll take longer for a bigger data set. I always like to highlight this model info results, number of tree nodes, max number of branches, number of levels. These are all information about how the tree was trained. If you build the tree in a graphical interface like Model Studio, you can actually see the leaves and the individual parts of the tree. In Python, we'd have to write some extra code to actually draw a picture of the tree. So I'll skip that because I figure if we want to look at the tree, we'd have built it in a graphical tool rather than in code. But these settings are nice because they tell you what sort of defaults you use. I didn't specify any settings on this tree, so I accepted all the defaults. In a little bit later on, I'll be going into the documentation and you can see where you'd look if you wanted to specify some more settings. So now we'll go on to score. Shockingly, we'll use the dtree score action set. So just like dtree train, there's also dtree score. We're going to score the validation data. So that's the, the same data set, Titanic, in this case where partition indicator equals zero. And we'll use the output from the training action. So the Titanic decision tree model is what was output by the train action. So that's the model we'll be using. Our CAS out for the score will be a score data set. This is basically the original data set with predictions appended. So instead of just having survived one or zero, we'll have our prediction for survived, which is you know from zero to one, basically. There'll be probabilities. We want to copy the target over because we want to assess how well we did at predicting the target. So I'll run the score action. And I like to highlight the results of the score action just to see what happened. So I named it Titanic Decision Tree Score. This is just a local Python object that holds some summaries of the results. We see that we have a variable p survived one, which is our prediction for whether they survived. p survived zero is our prediction for whether they died. So that's just the complement of p survived one. And then we've created this output table, Titanic Decision Tree Scored. It also tells us the misclassification rate. So we got about 23% wrong. It's a decent model, but not a great model. Now we actually want to assess. So we've gotten some misclassification rates, but there are a lot more assessments to do for our predictive models. In particular, we want to generate lift curves and ROC curves, which are very useful at evaluating how well our models perform. So we'll use the percentile action set and the assess action to essentially compare the difference between our prediction, which is p survived one up here, and the target, which is the true value. So we're really just running this assess to find the difference between the predicted output from the score action and the true, the true value of the target, which we know from the data set. So I'll run this assess action. And let's look at the results of the assess action. It creates these two tables, Titanic decision tree assessed, Titanic decision tree assessed ROC. So one of them is going to be lift information, and one of them is going to be ROC information. I bring these results locally. So Titanic Assess ROC is a local copy. So I'm essentially taking these in-memory tables right here and bringing them locally to Python. They're small tables. The ROC table has about 100 rows. The lift table has about 20. So this fits with our best practices, where we do all of the model building and development and assessment 
on the CAS server on SAS via, so remotely where we have more processing power. And then we bring the results over locally so we can plot and look at the results, sort of a summary of what we did. I'll just look at the first few rows of the ROC table. We see here's our probability of survival. We have different cutoff values. So we generate all these probabilities. We choose cutoff. So let's say if a cutoff of zero means everyone who has a probability above zero gets classified as a one, we're going to call everyone a one. That's probably a bad choice. A cutoff of 0.5 is basically half and half, or not really half and half, but half probability. If your probability is above 0.5, we predict you're a one. If it's below 0.5, we predict you're a zero. So what we're doing here is we're evaluating how well our model performs at all of these different cutoffs. We'll end up using that to create the ROC curve. We also have lift information, which tells us how well we're doing as we go through the data. So this depth, we sort the data based on the predicted probability. So the 5% here is the top 5% most likely to survive. And we look at how much more likely they are to survive in our model versus a random guessing model. And that would basically be what the cumulative lift is. I've brought these plots over, and there's, there's a lot more information on this in this short video. I won't talk too much about model assessment and analyzing these results, but we want to plot the ROC curve in the lift chart, and that'll probably be familiar to most of you who, who've done some predictive modeling in the past. So these are local data frames, Titanic ROC DF and Titanic lift DF. So now we're just going to plot them using matplotlib. So I'll just generate the figure. I will plot on the x-axis, 1 minus the specificity which is the false positive rate. And on the y-axis, I'll plot the sensitivity, which is the true positive rate. So we get an ROC plot for the decision tree model. This black line here is a random guessing model. And this blue line is our true model and an ideal model, a model that perfectly classified all the points would be a right angle in the top left. So our model is somewhere in between the perfect model and a random guessing model. You can see on the y-axis is the true positive rate, on the x-axis is the false positive rate, and we look at it for all these different values of cutoffs. We can also plot the lift. On the x-axis, we'll plot depth, and on the y-axis, we'll plot cumulative lift. And so we can see the model, as we go increase in depth, we improve, or essentially, we get fewer and fewer of our targets. I actually find this a little strange, and I, I've seen this, and it has to do with the fact that we didn't use very much data. So this is only 1,300 rows. But we actually find that some of our highest predicted probabilities are actually incorrect, whereas ones that were slightly lower, so around the 20% mark, were actually did better. So we were more likely to find people who survived a little bit lower in our list of sorted probabilities. So it means that our model made a bit of a mistake here. Again, it has to do with we partitioned our 1,300 rows into 900 rows of training and 300 rows of validation, and this is only being assessed on the validation data. So it's a pretty small data set here. Looking at these results, I sort of find that the model worked okay, but not great. And this motivates me to think, maybe I should build some other models. So maybe a random forest model and a gradient boosting model. So I'm gonna try those again. What I'm gonna do here is develop some code for you. This is sort of how I would do it in my office if I if I'd built all this and I said, yeah, I kind of want to build some other models. So I'm gonna go back up to where I trained the decision tree model. I'm gonna just copy all the code out of it, paste it down here. And I'm going to switch it, and I don't need to load the action set again because I've already done that. And I'm going to switch it to a forest model. Let's go look at the documentation so we can find what the forest model action would be. Usually when I go to the documentation, I just Google SAS CAS actions. It's the easiest way to get to the documentation page. I click the first link, Cloud Analytic Services. And it's SAS via actions and action sets by name and product. Action sets by name. And I'll have a link to this under the video, just this documentation page. I'll go to D for decision tree. I'll click decision tree. This is the decision tree action set. So all of these actions are related to decision trees. You should be familiar already. We've seen the D tree train and the D tree score for building a decision tree. Now we're going to want to use forest train, forest score for a forest, and GB tree train and GB tree tr score for gradient boosting. So I'll go back to our code and I'll just change D tree train to forest. And I should probably name the output something different, Titanic forest model. I'll just copy this again. Oh, I ran it and paste, instead of running it, I'll paste it. 
And I'll switch this to GB tree. GB tree train. And I will name this Titanic grad boost model. So this trains a forest and a gradient boosting model. We can see some results for them. Now we want to score them. So I'll scroll back up. I'll grab the score action from the decision tree. And I'll just paste it in below at the bottom. I'll go ahead and paste it twice, once for gradient boosting and once for the forest. So I'll switch this to forest score. And of course, the output is going to want to be the forest model. And we're going to use the forest model. I'll mention this. If I were actually doing this in a production environment and I had to do this a lot, I'd probably make like a for loop to iterate through these in Python. But then it would make it a little bit harder to learn what I'm doing. So I'm sort of showing you off. I'm showing off sort of how I'm doing this. And this I called grad boost. This also called grad boost. And this will be the GB tree score action. So just to make sure I did everything, forest score, forest model, forest scored, GB tree score, grad boost model, grad boost scored. So now I've scored the data and I have output scored data for the gradient boosting and the forest models. The next step is to do the assessments. So I'll grab the percentile action sets. And actually, I don't need these first two rows because they've already been submitted. And in this case, I will name this forest assess. And of course, we'll use the forest score table. And here we'll use the forest assessed. And I'll go ahead and copy this and do the same thing for gradient boosting. This time I'll call it grad boost. In many ways, what I'm doing right now is just organizing my work for myself so that I know what I've done later on. I, I could use all the same names. It's definitely not a good practice in coding. So I'll run the assess action again. Now I'll go up and I will bring the results locally. And of course, I have to change these. Titanic assess ROC forest. Titanic assess lift forest. And we'll definitely use the forest assessed ROC and the forest assessed here. And I should also name this forest. Forest. I'm just organizing some of my work here. And I'll copy all of these and do the same thing for the gradient boosting. Once I run this, I've brought all of my data locally. So now I can make those plots. And that's really what we were interested in, generating an ROC plot. And you can see I'm just copying and pasting code that I wrote earlier. And that's pretty much the best way to code. Once you've developed something once, don't, don't reinvent the wheel. And I want to plot both the forest and the gradient boosting on the same plot. but I want them to look different. So I'll make one red, one blue. May as well change the title to reflect it. And so now we see ROC curve and I, I should add a legend. And we see the ROC plot. It looks like the gradient boosting and the forest model do similarly well, just a little bit better than the decision tree model. We'll go ahead and grab the lift plot as well. And we'll do the exact same thing. So I'll grab this one line and copy it. And then this is the forest data frame. And the second one should not be forest. It should be the gradient boosting. And we'll change one line to red. And the title should properly reflect what we're looking at. And I'm going to just copy the legend from the prior plot. And so we can see cumulative lift. It looks like the forest does a little bit better at the beginning. The gradient boosting model doesn't do quite as well as the forest model.
So then at the end of the day, we can use these plots to determine whichever model we think is the best and use that model. Now, so far in this video, we've really only done predictive modeling using CAS Actions and Python. But if we go back to the documentation page, there are all sorts of different actions that you have. All of these CAS Actions, all of these commands to the SAS via server can be submitted from a Python interface. So in this video, we really focused on predictive modeling using Python and SAS via. But there are a variety of other things that you can do with Python and SAS via. So if we look down, we can see things like deep learning action set that I really like and enjoy have used before. There's dimension reduction and other data preprocessing action sets. And then there's specific actions like things related to economic capital modeling and explainable model actions, model interpretability action sets. All these actions can be submitted from Python using the SAS via server. So it's all sort of the same interface, but you'll use different actions depending upon what you want to accomplish with Python and SAS via. So we've just finished up building some predictive models in Python. Hope you enjoyed seeing Python integration with SAS via. Click to subscribe to the SAS users channel. Click here to answer some questions to help us make better videos. And then down here are some links both to the data as well as on some papers that go into more detail or give you a nice refresher of what we talked about.